Good morning, everyone, and thanks again for turning out on this fairly chilly day here in the Cape. Dylan is going to talk to us today about the Stianbras Aquifer, where they, again, the company and Dylan have done a lot of great work, um, also providing water supply to Cape Town. So Dylan is an associate and principal geologist at, at the Musenberg-based Earth Science and Hydrological Consultancy on Vota Africa. He has worked on a range of groundwater projects from small-scale domestic properties to large-scale mu municipal well fields across South Africa and East Africa since 2007. And, and as we know, some of us have heard him before, this has included the various TMG, Table Mountain Group fractured, fractured aquifers and Stanford aquifer well fields at Supply Hermanus and Stanford respectively. He is also director of the newly established nonprofit organization called the, the Mbota Foundation, which aims to develop community capacity and foster social responsibility with regard to the environment and water resources. He completed his BSc undergrad and honors degrees in geology and environmental, self, uh, environmental science at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and is currently registered for his MSc in geology at the University of Cape Town. Um, he has various other associations and memberships um, and just as a sort of sideline in his hobbies in his spare time he enjoys bodyboarding when he, he says when he can find warm water. Um, reading, watching, mostly science fiction, and listening to weird, heavy music. So with that um, sort of astounding background, we'll hand over to you, Dylan, and thanks for making yourself available. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to present. So I'll be presenting on groundwater exploration and development of the Table Mountain Group Aquifers as part of the City of Cape Sound's new water program. This work we do under Zutari, he used to be at uh, Oricon and they are employed by the city of Cape Town. Just some of the pictures you see here, there's just some of the high yielding holes, both reduction holes on the left, the H of A13 hole during drilling. The top center was the H182 borehole when we were testing it at 70 liters per second, discharging into the upper Stianbras Dam. And then the two, the bottom center and right are two artesian boreholes into the peninsula aquifer in Tevas Cliff and Arkenhof. Yeah, so I just want to dedicate this in memory of uh, Rowena and Chris. Rowena was the founder and managing director of Mboda Africa, the founder of the Mboda Foundation. And Chris was also a director of Mboda Africa and a ex-professor in structural geology at UCT. Um, and they sadly passed away from COVID-19 um, just over a month ago. So yeah. I'm just going to give a just as an overview of the presentation, um, just an overview of the city's TMG projects uh, as a whole, and then just a quick overview of the various target areas, and then focus on Stianbras um, and the work we've been doing there so far, and then just some lessons learned and the way forward. And then the picture uh, at the bottom is the um, is the dam wall between the upper Stianbros Dam, which is on the left-hand side, and the lower Stianbros Dam on the right-hand side. And this was during the peak of the day zero drought. This was um, in February 2018, just before it rained in winter 2018. Um, but you can see how low the dam levels were in the lower Stianbros Dam. They were below 20%, whereas the upper Stianbros Dam is relatively full in this case, about 80%, and that's because of the donation of 10 million cubic meters of water from um, the um, Kronland Water, um, yeah, the Kronland Water Users Association, um, who manage Arkenhof Dam. Um, and I like to think in the future that the TMG uh, aquifers can kind of provide that security and not have to hope for donations from surface water um, in times of drought. Um, and in the distance, you can actually see the TMG in the um, Kuchelberg Mountains, and that's essentially where the Stiermrush Wildfield is situated. So the original uh, name of the TMG project for CFK Town was called the Table Mountain Group Aquifer Feasibility Study and Pilot Project. So quite a mouthful. Um, and it was initiated in 2002. Um, John Weaver, who's on the call here, he was um, also involved in the, the original um, 
conception and preliminary phases of the project as part of the TMG Aquifer Alliance when he was at the CSR with Mboto and Nilam Shan before they became Oricon and then Zutari. Um, and the aim of the feasibility study was to determine uh, the potential of augmenting um, the city's water supply with groundwater predominantly from the um, peninsula aquifer um, and the Nodder aquifer. Um, uh, it was in four phases, um, so inception phase and then the preliminary phase and exploratory phase, and there were some delays in between each phase because of EIAs originally, because groundwater abstraction uh, in the early 2000s was still a trigger for EIAs, it's not anymore. Um, and then the delay between the exploratory phase and what was to become the new water program was because it rained quite decently between 2012 and 2016, and there was a reduction in demand, um, also through the water conservation and water demand measures that the city put in place. Um, but like I was saying to John this morning, when he gave me a call to check that I was coming in online, is that um, uh, you want to drill when it rains um, so that your well field is ready um, for when there is drought and not have the situation where we had during the day zero drought when there was panic stations and uh, the prior mayor thought that you could drill a thousand meter deep borehole in a, a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, the new water program kind of took over the TMG aquifer, aquifer feasibility study. Um, and sorry, what I meant to say is as part of the, the, the kind of alternative water resources that the city was looking at, um, from early the early 2000s, it also included desalination and water reuse. And that's also kind of come into the new water program. Um, so in the new water program, we've looked at the TMG and Stiernbrows, Ripo, Tivas, Vemasuk, and then potentially also uh, in other parts of the city, such as uh, and outside of um, the city in the catchments that the city manages and their dams, um, such as Full Flay, the Big River, the Southern Planning District, which is essentially the South Peninsula. Um, the new water program also includes the primary aquifers, so the Cape Flats aquifer wellfield development, and then um, the upgrade of the Atlant Atlantis aquifer wellfield. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on the slide. We all know that um, uh, Cape Town and the Greater Western Cape and all the Eastern Cape is still in it, uh, underwent the so-called day zero drought between 2015 and 2018. Um, and, um, the Southern Cape, uh, where in the Overberg area had their own um, droughts, uh, one in 150 year Southern Cape droughts um, in 2009 to 2011. Um, and the lower three graphs is just to, it's just to show um, uh, what's called the Falcon Mark Index, which is a water security index. And it's just to show that even with an increase in yield in the Western Cape water supply system, which is the, the middle graph um, by 2030, um, the actual water security index of the country still declines um, and only increases slightly. Um, and that's because of the exponential growth of Cape Town. So to kind of provide enough water for not only just for people to drink and survive, but to ensure development um, of the city and to take half the city's population out of poverty and to meet the SDG goals, um, we're going to have to look at alternative water resources other than surface water, and the TMG can play a role um, in increasing that water security index to where everyone in the city can hopefully live a decent life. So um, this is just from the International Association of Hydrogeologists, I and mean, then just a quick punt, the actual 2023 conference will be in Cape Town, um, so that's a, a great thing for South African hydrogeology especially since we had the International Geological Congress um, only uh, five years ago in 2016. Um, so obviously the IH and hydrogeologists, um, we all know why groundwater is critical for, for urban water supply and security, um, but they kind of produced this position paper um, to, to kind of make the general public more aware. And mainly it's because of the kind of large natural storage that aquifers have um, that can carry water supply or a sheer water supply security drain, drain droughts. And this is going to become increasingly important in, in climate change um, in the future. Um, and we've already seen um, some of the extreme heat um, that's taking place um, in Canada and 
the Mediterranean at the moment, and obviously the droughts that we've gone through, which are likely to increase in frequency and severity. And um, Shafiq Adams from the WRC actually just um, published a really good article in the Daily Maverick today or this morning about um, the importance of using storage in groundwater and managed um, uh, aquifer recharge um, uh, for, for urban water supply in South Africa and Africa as a whole. And um, we know in Hermanus, where a lot of you guys stay, um, the importance of, of using groundwater um, to get through drought periods. So um, Hermanus abstracts groundwater from three TMG uh, well fields. Um, the Gateway well field, oh, let me just bring my pointer up quickly. The Gateway well field in red. Um, the Campbell well field in green and the Vormwood well field in yellow. Um, and those three well fields supply about 30 to 40 percent of the Greater Hermanus area water supply at the moment. And um, we're busy increasing that to 50 percent. Um, and use and when in use conjunctively with the divorce dam surface water, it ensured that Hermanus actually didn't have to have severe water restrictions during the the day zero drought and also help the city get the town get through the 2009-2011 drought. Um, so that's just a very good example of um, how groundwater can assist in urban water, bulk urban water supply. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too much detail. I'm sure you all know we study in, in uh, uh, South, uh, Southern Africa, South Africa specifically. Um, we're looking at the, the Table Mountain Group within the Cape Fold Belt. Um, so that's blue unit that you see in the uh, nice um, kind of CGS uh, postcard map. And then we are specifically focusing on the syntaxis of the Cape Fold Belt. So where the western and eastern branches of the Cape Fold Belt meet, um, and you get a mixing of the deformation styles, um, both the folding and faulting. And this causes increased fracturing of the thick quartzitic sandstones that form um, the peninsula and Scoverbeck formations of the TMG, um, which is good for groundwater. Um, so yeah, I'm sure most people also know the stratigraphy of the TMG, but it's essentially an order of vision to Devonian to 480 to 390 million year old package of slightly metamorphosed sedimentary rocks um, that underwent deformation during the Cape Orogeny in the Permian Triassic, so between two, about 280 and 230 million years ago, uh, as well as um, some deformation during Gondwana breakup between 180 and 110 million years ago. Um, so the major aquifers are the peninsula, what's called the peninsula aquifer, which is comprised entirely of the peninsula formation. Um, that's your, in the Stiambras area or east of Cape Town, that's your basal TMG unit. Um, and then the upper Nodda aquifer is comprised of the reef flare formation and the Scoverberg formation, and they are separated by a thin shale member called the Fillerin Valley member. It's about between 10 and 15 meters thick, and that kind of subdivides the Nodda into two uh, sub aquifers. Um, and then the Nodda aquifer and the Peninsula aquifer are separated by a series of shale rich, shale and siltstone rich um, units, the Pakes formation, which is a Tillite or glacial deposit, the Cedarberg Formation, which is um, has the Sioux member shales at the base, and then the Disa member shales, siltstones, and sandstones above that. Then the Khadini Formation, which is a shale sandstone, a reddish weathering sandstone, shale, and siltstone. And those three formations together form the Vincent Mega Aquitard and, and yeah, essentially separates the two major TMG aquifers. And, we can see this nicely in Hermanus, just to go back there, since you got, most of you guys know that area. Um, a lot of the residents in Hermanus abstract from the Nondo aquifer um, at surface, whereas the municipality abstracts from the deeper peninsula aquifer, and there's no interaction between the two aquifers, um, as almost two decades of monitoring has shown. So at Steenbrus, we also, uh, because they both um, in relatively Good thickness for drilling. So the Nodda aquifer stone brass is between 300 and 400 meters thick, whereas the Peninsula aquifer is around 600 to 700 meters thick in that area. Although it is at depths of 
800 meters and lower. Um, and we target both those, both those aquifers. And the TMG, uh, the, 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 the aquifers in the TMG are fractured aquifers or sec secondary or fractured aquifers. And that means that there's no groundwater <clears throat> in the primary porosity of the rock because there essentially is no primary porosity. It was removed during um, diagenesis and metamorphism during the Cape Orogeny. So you have solid rock where there's no water, but then that rock has been brecciated along major fold structures and in hinge zones of folds. And um, in these major structures, you have groundwater flow. And you can see in the pool boxes from some of the exploration drilling we did, <coughs> there's um, nice, nice intense fracturing and some of the kind of bigger chunks that come up when you hit these big brecciated zones uh, during percussion drilling. And that's kind of what you want to drill into where you have your highest hydraulic conductivities. So the main target areas um, of the the city's TMG projects extended initially all the way north up to after Witzenberg and all the way south to Kuckelberg. Uh, they mainly focused um, on uh, large regional structures, um, which are termed hydrotechs. So they're these big regional features where you can expect regional groundwater flow. And these features in association with um, existing water reticulation infrastructure. So the, the major dams of the Western Cape water supply system. So Akta Wittenberg is a bit far and isn't in, in any really near any really um, water surface infrastructure. So that was um, discarded as a as a target. Brunfle and Kuchelberg, so the BNK target zones, Brunfle being here, Kuchelberg in the south became um, far field ecological monitoring sites. And then the city focused its attention on the Hudson South Hollands, the H area, which um, targets the Steam Brush Brunfle mega faults, which you see this northeast southwest structure running through here, which is a hundred kilometer long um, dextral strike slip fault, um, which runs all the way to the Worcester fault uh, and extends kilometers in depth, it's a crustal scale feature. Um, uh, and then and within that, you get the um, Neverberg thrust zone, which are um, flower structure thrust faults associated with the SBMZ. Um, and then also um, Tevars Cliff area, focusing on the Tevars Cliff Basin, where the TMG is essentially fed from all directions, recharge areas in all directions, and targeting it in along the Setains Cliff anticline. Um, other sites where we'll do potential work and well, we have done some exploration work in Vemersuk where the claimed Drakenstein faults is targeted. Although that's a much smaller TMG compartment in comparison to Stiernbrust and Neverberg and, and to Vazcliff, and then also potentially full flow um, to supply water into the Vemersuk and full flow dams respectively. So um, the city's water strategy in 2019 initially planned for 50 megalitres per day from the TMG by, by this year. But because of COVID and budget delays, that's been pushed out by a few years. Um, the plan is to provide um, about 15 to 20 megalitres per day from Stiernbrus Wellfield, and then 10 to 15 megalitres per day from Neverberg Wellfield, um, which is just north northwest or uh, yeah, around Akonov Dam. Um, Bacharabo, and then the Cliffontaine Wellfield, which is just south of Tebowas Cliff Dam. Um, the table on the left just shows the the what is the the volumes that were applied for the water use license applications um, to the to the National Department of Water and Sanitation um, in, in various phases. But at the moment, you know, we just the city's focusing on Steenbrus, uh, Neverberg, and Cliffontaine. But there is potentially in the future. Um, provided that these initial well fields are successful and do not show major ecological impacts, um, that there's potentially 400 to 500 megalitres per day um, from all seven TMG targets, um, which could supply half to a third of the city's future water supply. But this is in the, in the long term, um, the next 20 to 30 years. So it is a very important resource going forward. Um, so zooming into Stiernbrus itself, um, just showing just showing these slides. Just um, so when I talk about the the borehole names, you have some idea where they are. So the the way the balls are named, the the first letter H ref refers to the target zone, um, so the Hudson of Holland, 
And then the ones, twos, et cetera, are the target site areas. Um, and then there's also target site sub areas. So the actual target site areas like H1, H2, et cetera, they target different features in the Steenbrus area. And the same for the Neverberg and Iconoff areas, which are T1, T2, et cetera. And then um, in Tivarskliff Dam, the G1 and G2 is for Frenlandberg. So as I, just, as I mentioned earlier, the main um, hydro, hydrogeological target um, in the Stiambras area that the Stiambras Wellfield targets is the Stiambras Brunflow Megafold Zone, which, like I said, is this crustal scale dextral strikes at fault. Um, and it forms this major hydrotect where you have um, elevated hydraulic conductivity and groundwater flow moving from the the northeast to the southwest and discharging into False Bay. Um, the various strands of the faults on this image are, are shown in orange. Um, and then the kind of whole zone is highlighted in red. And then you can see these two northwest southeast cross sections uh, across the across Stiambras um, with the dashed red block showing the position of the fault. Uh, Stiambras or the Stiambras area itself is folded. Um, like you get in most of the TMG and the Cape Full Belt. Um, and you have the, the, the one structure is the Stiambra Syncline, which is this northeast southwest orientated uh, feature where the dam itself is situated on. And you get young, younger Gedo formation of the Porker Fault Group sitting at surface. Um, and then it extends um, and forms the Kuchelberg Anticline, which you can see if you are um, in uh, cool by and you look upwards to the mountains, you can actually see the, <coughs> the hinge zone of the Kuchelberg anticline quite nicely. Um, and the TMG and the Cape Fault Belt and the Basin Rocks um, were intruded by what's called the False Bay Suite, which is a, an early Cretaceous, uh, it's 100, around 136 million year old dark swarm um, that extends across False Bay. Um, so essentially from Stearnbrose across False Bay and then into the Cape Peninsula. And these were intruded during the um, during Gondwana breakup and the opening of the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, and yeah, they're quite <clears throat> and Stiembrus, I'll go into it later, but we originally thought they might comp the dikes might comp compartmentalize the TMG, but um, as I'll show you, uh, this is not the case. Um, and yeah, the dikes are these in this image, these purple lines that you see. So this is just an image of um, Stiembrus Wellfield looking southwestwards, uh, the SBMZ uh, in the zone, uh, dashed red lines, the H1, A2 and H1, A3B are the two highest yielding um, uh, Nardo aquifer boreholes that we drilled. We tested both of them at uh, 70 liters per second. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very high yielding holes and they're along the damage zone of the, in this case, the northern strand of the SBMZ. Um, and you can just, this just shows the shape of the syncline, the hinge of the Stiambrus syncline, and then the Fado formation um, situated where the majority of the dam is uh, in the center of the Stiambrus syncline. Um, so yeah, the structure along the SVMZ is quite complicated. Um, this is in the south southwestern most portion of it. Um, as you, this is essentially a cool word. We drive along Clarence Drive from Gordon's Bay to Roy Arroyos. Um, and there's two major strands, the northern strand and the southern strand. And there's, there's um, like I said, dextral uh, strike slip displacements of about 300 to 700 meters on both strands. But in this area, it looks like there is some, at least some normal displacements as well um, of about 100 meters. Um, so some transtensional movement, but that's not to say this is the set. This is the kind of setup along the whole extent of the Timbers Brunflay Megafault. It looks like there is um, variations in in the um, displacements along the whole extent of the fault. So it's quite a complicated structure um, that's undergone uh, displacements in various times. And I'll show you uh, possibly even recent, relatively recently. Um, and it gets really complicated when you move into the, if you move northeastwards into the Neverberg area. So this is um, where they do the, um, It, uh, on the foofy slide, or <laughs> you know, I mean, in between the mountains, um, and um, yeah, you have this is the SBMZ, and you have these uh, thrust faults, these high angle thrust faults, which are quite unique. 
uh, in the area. Um, they likely reactivated um, uh, old normal basement structures that were reactivated um, probably during Gondwana breakup. And these thrust faults are essentially flower structures caused by structs that movements along the SPMZ. And it causes the, in this case, the triplication of the TMG in the Niverberg area. So you can see the, the Cedarberg formation um, being repeated. Um, and it's also then dissected by younger normal faults. Um, so yeah, it's quite complicated stratigraphy and structure in this area. And we have exploration holes in this area, but um, we haven't been allowed to drill um, production extract wide diameter holes in this area because it's managed by Cape Nature. Um, but there is very high groundwater potential in this area because from the explor exploratory holes we've drilled, um, the TMG is brecciated almost to like it's running sand, so it looks like beach sand. Um, so very high permeability and porosity material that would be good for groundwater abstraction. But yeah, hopefully one day in the future, we could potentially drill wide diameter holes there. So this slide just shows the kind of structure that you see in, um, in the Stienbrass and Everberg area. So these are the Northwest, um, Southeast cross sections, just showing variations in folding. Um, and then these are kind of northeast, southwest sections um, parallel to the, the uh, main fold hinges and the Stuenbrust Brown Flame Megafold. And you do get this large scale um, cross folding, um, which forms a kind of results in a basin like shape in the Stuenbrust area within the TMG. Um, So that one of the, the one of the reasons what makes the TMG such a good aquifer in the Western Cape region is um, because it's comprised of uh, very erosion resistant quartzites, some of the hardest rocks on the planet. Um, you have these these the, the big mountain ranges of the Cape Fold Belt, and that generates orographic rainfall, and that orographic rainfall and and snow um, results in elevated recharge into the fractured aquifers of the TMG. So we're looking at um, this zone here in the red block, the purples and the blues, uh, which indicates uh, high recharge areas. Um, and if you zoom in, um, this just shows the unconfined or exposed portions at surface of the Skiverberg and Pinchler formations and where the elevated recharge occurs. Um, so the kind of conceptual model is you get recharge um, in the Neverberg and Iconoff area, um, both for the Noda and the peninsula, you then get groundwater flow. It hits against the Stienbrust Brown Flame Megafold zones where the strand, the actual cores of the of the various strands of the of the faults are impermeable and acts as a barrier to flow, whereas the damage on either side is where you have your high hydraulic conductivity. You then have um, southwestwards flow along the SPMZ and the hinge zone of the Stienbrust incline. Where you get discharge from the Nardo and the, at the Stiambras River and Peninsula Aquifer discharge out into False Bay. Um, you also get re, uh, recharge in the uh, Hudson Hollands Mountains um, in the Peninsula Formation and then discharge uh, groundwater flow also towards the SBMZ. Um, but you, because of the younger cross cutting northwest southeast faults in those areas, you might get flow across the SBMZ into the Tivasco Basin or you might get flow also along the SBMZ southwestwards. And then there's also a recharge in the Frunland, uh, in the Kuchelberg Mountains for both the peninsula and the Norda Aquifer. So we, um, we did some uh, heliborne geophysics, um, magnetic radiometric as well as EM. Um, this is the, the helicopter that was flying around in 2018. If you might have seen it, um, it was also done in the Cape Flats in Atlantis. It wasn't a UFO, but yeah, it does look like one when you see it in the sky. Um, so like I explained, the original conceptual model had the full space sweet dogs compartmentalizing the TMG and acting as potential barriers to groundwater flow. They still do, um, but they're not total barriers. Um, and that's because the Haley-Born geophysics we did shows that the, the strands of the, the TMS brown flame megafold actually just break through and displace the the full space sweet docks, and I'll zoom in and show you in closer in closer detail. Um, but this means that there's been at least younger than 136 millennial movements along the, the various strands of the SPMZ. 
at least in the so the so-called H1 area and the H8 area. In the H5 and H6 areas, um, displacement is not as an intense, and the ducts um, seem to extend across the SBMZ. So it seems there was some kind of preferential displacement for whatever reason in this area, and not so much in this zone at that time. Um, so the dikes might still act as a barrier to flow, at least in this part of the of Steinbrus. Um The radiometrics, which was thorium, um, potassium, and uranium, um, picked up the, the shale-rich uh, units nicely, which helped us just delineate those where it was a bit more difficult with vegetation cover. And the EM, unfortunately, it didn't show too much uh, because of that kind of thick, what's the nature of the, the TMG. Um, but yeah, this, this is in the H1 area and shows the displacements of the these false face sweet docks along the northern strand of the SPMZ. Um, and the H1A2 hole over here, um, we, we targeted that for drilling. Um, and yeah, had a nice 75 liters per second with only about 50 meters drawdown during testing. Um, and yeah, when, I'll show you later. When we drilled into this into this hole um, at 185 meters, there was a pseudo, essentially a pseudo caustic uh, cavern um, where you, it's it's so wide at depth the uh, the geophysics can't pick up. When we did the the caliper, you can't pick up the edges of it. So when you see in the downhole camera, it just looks like a black cavern, and you get these pseudo caustic features along damage zones and the TMG or brecciated fault zones because of the acidic groundwater essentially dissolves out the rock. Um, so it's quite a unique feature in the TMG when you usually expect caustic features in uh, uh, carbonate rocks, you actually see them in silicic rocks. Um, and you can see them if you go to Cold Bay, you get the caves in Cold Bay. Um, we also wanted to drill H1A5, but we've been prevented at the moment because of uh, ecology, ecological concerns, which I'll show you later. But hopefully in the future one day, we will drill H1A5. And just an example, H1A1, which we drilled which is not that far off the damage zone. That hole only pumps at eight liters per second versus 70 liters per second. So it's a factor of 10 difference, showing how important it is to get as close to these damage zones as possible. Um, yeah, we also just did some land-based geophysics to the Northeast of Steenbrus, um, just to better delineate the, the various strands of the uh, Steenbrus front plane megafault. Um, yeah, so we did land-based resistivity and you actually can pick up um, the nice low resistivity parts where the strands pass through versus the high resistivity unfractured quartzites. Um, this is reflate formation at surface in that area. So it helps us be able to delineate for potential future boreholes uh, in the Akinov area going forward. And yeah, like I said, we just did some down, we did downhill geophysics. Um, and this is that kind of cavern I was talking about at the base of H1A2. And you can see the caliper here, um, the caliper log here, and also the elevated porosity and transversivity uh, and hydraulic conductivity uh, from that zone. So focusing on Stearnbrose, um, there's a total of 35 holes that have been drilled. Um, and they range from peninsula and Skiverberg monitoring, so the red are peninsula monitoring holes. The yellow, sorry, not the, the yellow are not the aquifer monitoring boreholes. Uh, the light blue are not the aquifer production holes, and the dark blue are peninsula production holes. Um, because the peninsula aquifer is so deep in this area, it's it's a depth of greater than 800 meters. Um, there's only at the moment, only four production holes into the peninsula, while there's a much greater range of Nordo aquifer production holes because it's a lot shallower and easier to get into. So yeah, there's, like I said, there's 24 completed Nordo aquifer holes. They range from about 50 to 270 meters deep. Eight of those are percussion holes and the yields range from about 10 to 70 liters per second. The tested yields range from 10 to 70 liters per second. Um, the main high yielding holes that will be used for supply um, uh, semi-continuous supply, H1A2, H1A3B, H1A4B, HLA13, HLA11, and they can provide about 150 liters per second or 13 megaliters per day. And there's also 25 liters per second backup supply from H1A1, HLA2, and HLA7. So in total, about you can get about 15 megaliters per day from those um, NADA aquifer holes. Um, there's also 16 monitoring holes, 
And three of those can also be pumped at four to five liters per second if, requ if required. The peninsula aquifer, we have seven core monitoring holes. So they range from 100 to 975 meters deep. So obviously the shallower holes are where it's unconfined, the deeper holes where it's confined. <clears throat> um, we're busy with the four deeper holes, um, drilling in depths of excess of a thousand meters. So um, H889 is currently, or we finished, that's a thousand and two meters and tested that at 20 liters per second, which was the maximum yield of the pump that we could get in there. Uh, obviously it's because you have to telescope down the casing sizes at surface are a bit more narrower than the wide diameter pumps, or the wide casing and the wider diameter pumps you get into the Nardo holes. Um, HLA-5 is currently being drilled to 1,100 meters. HLA-4 is still to get into the peninsula and HLA-10 is also to be deepened to 1,100. Um, but we're hoping for well, about five megaliters per day from the four deep peninsula holes, which would give 20 megaliters per day for, for Stiambra's well field in total. And um, these uh, five Nardo holes have actually been, even though it's not reported on the city's dashboard weekly, those five holes have been pumping 10, about 10 to 15 megaliters per day into upper Stiambra's dam for the almost the past year. Um, as part of the commissioning, and because it's commissioning, um, the city hasn't reported it as official, but the board, those Nardo holes are pumping at the moment. Um, so yeah, the well field is actually operational. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, just to show that um, for, for wide diameter holes, we used a, a range of drilling techniques. Um, so for the shallower holes, use rotary air percussion. So the shallow and other holes, and then the upper portion of the deeper holes, we used air percussion. We then moved to flooded hole reverse circulation because of ecological concerns about groundwater discharge into the environment. So the, the flooded hole reverse circulation, which you can see in the containers and the two pictures on the left, allows you to control the water discharge without going into the environment and everything uh, is all water discharges pumped into the dam and none of it goes into the environment. Um, even though the TMG groundwater is is pretty clean um, and the, the rotor foam used is biodegradable, it's just to ensure that there was as little ecological impact as possible. And then below 800 to up to over a thousand meters, we had to use the, we've been using the hydraulic water hammer um, due to the high, um, the water column, the extensive water column, and uh, in some cases elevated artesian pressure in the deeper peninsula holes. Um, so we also use core drilling for the exploration holes. So obviously before we drill the deeper peninsula holes, you want to have some idea of what's going on, uh, which was important because the Khodini formation is actually over thickened in Stienbrus due to uh, faulting along the stem brush front and mega fault. Um, so the peninsula is at much deeper depths than it should be. Um, and that we picked up through this, this core drilling. But we also use core drilling to drill um, shallower monitoring holes um, in areas which are ecologically sensitive. So like where there's much smaller tracks uh, in the mountains in the Kuchelberg area, um, as well as parts of stem brush, um, because of the much more reduced drilling footprint of the core rigs. Um, so yeah, but the, the Clorix played dual role. Uh, for the test pumping, we did four to six one hour steps and then um, three day tests if it's less than five liters per second and seven days of greater than five liters per second constant discharge tests. And um, obviously we monitoring all the water levels during the well field commissioning um, as well as essentially long-term testing of the well field. Um, so the hydraulic conductivity ranges between 0.1 and 0.2 meters per day for the Nardo, um, with a range of 0.01 to 0.6, and the transmissivity is about 20 to 30 square meters per day, with a range of 4 to 80 square meters per day. We're still just testing the peninsula holes now, so I don't have the peninsula uh, K and T values. Um, the hydrochemistry, it's, I mean, the recharge areas are pristine and untouched, um, with very high groundwater quality. So uh, ECs of less than 20 millisiemens, which is essentially the same as tap water um, with very low nutrients. And the only issues are um, your elevated iron and manganese concentrations, which can range from 1 to 25 milligrams per liter, and your acidic pHs of 4.5 to 6. This is actually a picture from Hermanus, 
where uh, one of the older production holes drilled in the early 2000s, the rivets dissolved and the PVC casing, so that was all pulled out and steel casing was inserted instead. And this is a picture of Pre-Extool Treatment Works um, where there's a biofiltration plant um, that removes the iron and manganese from the extracted TMG groundwater before being mixed in with surface water storage and reticulation system. So at the moment, Stiembrus, the groundwater is just pumped directly into the upper dam without treatment um, uh, because the iron concentrations in the northern aquifer are actually quite low. It's around one milligram per liter in that area. Um, but in the future, they will build a pre-treatment works to remove the iron and manganese before discharging into the upper dam. And we've also been collecting stable isotopes, radiocarbon and tritium. Um, but I'm not going to go into detail that here. So we quite uniquely uh, for South Africa, or it's becoming more prominent in South Africa, is the ecological um, concerns with drilling um, to reduce the drilling footprint. Um, and it's, it, it plays into the role of geoethics to kind of have as least impact as possible and to uh, drill and in this case extract groundwater as sustainably as possible. Um, so all drilling is, was restricted to existing and well field infrastructure was existing uh, was restricted to existing access roads and tracks and fire breaks and forestry areas to reduce any direct habitat or biodiversity loss and all groundwater expelled during drilling and testing was uh, transferred to um, Stienbrus Dam or in other areas such as Ikenoff Dam. So there's no groundwater discharge into the environment as all, at all. Um, and then prior to drilling, there's search and rescue of um, any endangered uh, species. Uh, there's a nursery on site where everything is, is stored. Um, and the top swell is then also cleared but stored on site. And then once the sites are rehabilitated, the top swell is put back on and then the rescue species are replanted. Um, and this, the, all, this, all this is done is because the Cape Florista Kingdom is one of the most endemic uh, one of the has the highest endemic species or one, one of the highest endemic species concentrations in the world. So there's three percent of all species on earth occur within this 0.06 land percent land area that you see highlighted here. But within this area, 13 percent of all plant species on earth are, are under threat. And the, the Cape Florida Kingdom has a strong link with the the Cape Fall Belt and the TMG aquifers. And this is because of how the fame boss has evolved over the last few million years with the, with the Cape Fall Belt geomorphology. Um, and this is, yeah, in a, in a lot of cases, um, fame boss associated with, with wetlands is, is linked to groundwater discharge. Um, and these are called groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, what Dale did as masters on that. Um, and they can either be structurally controlled um, because of uh, dikes, such as the full space feed dikes here, or because of faults, um, or the theologically controlled, where you have discharge along the contact between, uh, say, the peninsula aquifer and the cedar, the peninsula aquifer and the cedarberg formation, which acts as a, an aquitard. And yeah, we've got to be very careful not to impact um, on these on, on these critical GDEs. Um, uh, yeah, so there's there's extensive monitoring, which I'll show you now, that's been taking place over the last 15 years or so. Um, so there's a there's an extensive regional monitoring system that the city set up that extends from Kuchelberg all the way to Vermesok, and that includes, uh, they're called eco-seeps, but essentially wetlands and, and associated channels, river channels, stream channels. And then there's rain gauges, monitoring boreholes, not, not just what the city did, but also from WRC projects, um, and uh, from DWS, um, and then stream gauging stations and also remote sensing. Um, and, and on top of that, we've done additional um, kind of wetland uh, mapping and identification at a much detailed, much more detailed scale in Stienbrus, uh, which you can see in the, the top left image here. Um, and the bottom right is just an example of some of the kind of field monitoring that takes place at these wetlands where they do soil moisture, um, 
plant uh, species, floral species counts, uh, pulsometers that measure water, shallow water levels in the wetland. Um, uh, yeah, Dale Dale is also quite uh, strongly involved in this. So if you ever want any further detail, he's also the person to speak to. And, uh, and of course, we're also doing numerical groundwater modeling of various extraction scenarios to see potential impacts um, on these systems. Um, so this is just an example of um, some of the remote sensing work we've been doing to try to pick up um, kind of groundwater dependent ecosystems across um, which which should show strong signatures in the drought periods, so very low moisture stress indices. Um, and then in association with that, we've we identified potential groundwater discharge zones, which is these little white dots and linking those to wetlands. Um, to, to try to identify all the potential wetlands um, and then ground treating them in the Stienbrass and Neverberg areas um, and then developing kind of risk assessments of which are at most risk to abstraction. And then um, in association with that, um, to try to rehabilitate areas um, that may be abstracted. So um, the term just escaped me now, but yeah. Um, Kind of essentially paying back if it causes any damage. Um, this is just showing some of the longer term monitoring uh, that we've been doing it's, it's in the Nada Aquifer and Stienbras since 2009. Um, and you can see the nice kind of summer and winter um, changes, seasonal changes in groundwater levels. Uh, you can pick up some of the, the drought periods where you see water levels declining slightly. The, 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 the troughs in summer are, are lower than the than the drought periods, and the peaks are also lower in comparison to the wetter periods. Um, and then, what you see in the far end is when we when we busy developing Stiembrus well field, um, and that's reactions to pumping and testing around this monitoring hole. But even during this, you can see that the water levels in the pulsometers of a nearby uh, wetland remain stable, as well as flow within the, the channel. Um, but this is the kind of long, uh, we'll continue this in the future to make sure we aren't having an impact on, on these wetland systems. And this is just zooming in on that, uh, this Porsche, this, this, deep, this uh, relative, I mean, it's, it's far, far to 10 meters, it's not like 100 meters of decline in water level. And just to show um, the various activities that were taking place at the time that caused the various drops in water levels. And these are the sorry, and these are the boreholes. The the HLA3 is the borehole that was monitored, and these are all the boreholes that are drilled in the vicinity of it at the time. And you can also pick up interesting features if you really zoom into the, the water level data. And this is was one of Chris's joys. Um, is that you can pick up things in the confined aquifers, you can pick up uh, earth tide uh, signatures, so um, amplitudes and the water levels due to the solar lunar cycle. Um, so you can see in the full and, and new moon phases, you get these increased uh, water level variations. Um, whereas in um, the more the channels and the and the the pulsometers in the shadow uh, wetland uh, wetlands, you see a more evaporation diurnal signature, um, and you can kind of distinguish just from the water levels the the difference in supply of water to the various features and aquifers. Um, this is just to show some of the long, uh, the, the long term, the current monitoring, water level monitoring that's been undertaken, and some of the, um, well, not some, all the production and monitoring holes in Siembras and the, in the Nardo Aquifer. What's interesting is in the red you have the southern strand of the SBMZ, um, and like I said earlier, the core of the fault is annealed and acts as a barrier to flow. So abstraction from H1, A3, B, H1, A4, B, H1, A2, and H1, A1, which you see in the pumped water levels here, you do not see a uh, water level of response in the H1A4A, H1A10, and H1A11 boreholes, which are these three at the top here, which are south of that, of that southern strand, because of the annealed core nature of that southern strand. And that's important, uh, has important implications in that um, your, your um, drawdown is going to be in a kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, it of like a cone shape around the the damage zone of the of the strands, but it's not going to ex it's unlikely to extend into the Kuchelberg region itself, um, where you have important uh, GDEs, etc. 
Um, so this is important to continue this kind of monitoring. And you see the same thing in the H8 area, where H8A15 and H8A2, which you can see here at the top, do not show any response to abstraction at the moment, but hopefully into the future as well from the various production balls to the north because of that annealed, quarter, annealed nature of the, of the southern strand of the fault. Um, and yeah, I can spend an, uh, half an hour talking about this, so I won't do that because it's running out of time and we're near, near the end of the presentation. But this is just to show some of the conceptual modeling um, in the NIDA aquifer that we've been doing between the various sub aquifers uh, and the influences of the various strands of the faults, the false space sweet ducts, the Fleurin Valley member, which acts as an aquitard separating the reef flow and scurvy formations, uh, and then the various wetland features that pop up because of all these geological um, variations in the aquifers. Um, and then the images on the right just show the, the piezometric map and modeling we've been doing to work out groundwater flow paths in the area. Um, and yeah, this is just to show some of the numerical modeling we're busy with. Um, this is a, um, a 3D geological model that was set up on Groundhog by Lachelle Goslin. Um, here, I'm not sure if she's talked the over big geoscientist group yet but yeah she's a great structural geologist and she's been doing um, some nice modeling work and then that's been input into the numerical model um, using fee flow and this is just to show some of the calibrations um, and yeah this is the actual modeled water level surface which is pretty similar to if you look here we can't really see it too well but yeah similar to the real life um, piezometric surface we've seen at the moment from the monitoring data we've been collecting and then with aquifer management, the whole well fields run off the run off SCAD, a SCADA system and controlled from a little office at Stianbras. Um, so it's managed real time um, and it collects a whole bunch of data, obviously water level, conductivity, flow rates, but then there's all other pump information. And that, that data is then all saved and, and analyzed. Um, so it's a nice system. Hermanus runs, the Hermanus well fields also run off a similar system as this. <laughs> Um, and then in the, what we're busy setting up at the moment is um, a GNSS, so geodetic monitoring system. Um, you can see these um, GNSS receiver or antennas and receivers on, um, at the moment, down three of the other production holes. And we will install the last two on the two, pinch, the two of the peninsula production holes. And they essentially measure millimeter scale vertical shifts um, and horizontal movement as a result of abstraction um, to try, and that's to try, um, first of all, see if there's kind of ground, the variations in um, ground motion changes on either sides of some of these fault strands, and also allows you to determine um, some aquifer parameters, such as the skeletal compressibility of the aquifer matrix, which you can bring into storage calculations. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully in the future, in the next few months, we'll install the seismic monitoring system using um, portable seismic devices around Stienbrus. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but the previous presentation asked why portable, not permanent. And uh, I forgot to mention that there's also the power, I mean, some of the areas, the power supply is an issue because it's out in the mountains. So there's no there's no power supply, um, so we have to use things that run off batteries, essentially, hence the portable nature. But in some of the sites, we will probably install more permanent seismic monitoring systems in, in, in the production boreholes where there is a power source. So the last few slides in conclusion. Um, I mean, as, as geologists, we all know that the more you you, I mean, I'm sure most of you are more involved in exploration, geology, and mineral uh, and ore deposits, but um, we need to apply the same kind of principles to hydrogeology, which isn't always done uh, in, in South Africa. Um, and the, the TMG especially has very complex geology and hydrogeology, and there's always surprises, um, like we picked up now with the displaced full space sweet dikes, the over thickening of the Hurlini formation and Stienbras, just in Stienbras itself, and those kind of things. So. The more geophysics, field and remote mapping and exploratory quadrant you can do uh, where possible, the, you reduce your surprises and you reduce your risk of, of failure with respects to borehole drilling and, and yields. Um, 
and you have to be prepared for difficult trading conditions in the TMG because of the highly fractured nature of the aquifers. So you can get really high yields. I mean, some of the Nardo holes, the blow yields were 100 to 200 liters per second during drilling. You get these, these pseudo caustic cavities, like I was talking about, that you can see here, um, which can be coll cause collapsing and break drilling equipment. Um, so you have to work quite closely together with drillers to develop solutions and have to have someone on top, someone on site pretty much the entire time for time is problem sol solving. And yeah, like I mentioned earlier, ecological environmental management is becoming stricter on site. Um, and this is because of the geoethic, geoethical considerations. The plane is becoming much more important in our industry. And I'm just going to punt that this will be submitted in October. And uh, it's a thing we did uh, at the geoethics and groundwater management conference last year, which was online, unfortunately, because of COVID. It was supposed to be in Portugal, but yeah, it's the geoethics of bulk water, bulk groundwater abstraction in Stienbrus. Um, but we're going to do a paper on the whole of, of Cape, all the Cape Town groundwater projects. And that will also be dedicated to Chris and Rowena because it was a passion of Chris's um, uh, geoethics. And you need an integrated team for well for development and bulk water supply. So your specialists, such as your hydrogeologists, your engineers, ecologists, but then also all your contractors, um, not just your drillers, but civil pumps, electric, electronic. Everyone has to work together and not work in silos. Um, and you have to work with your municipal clients as much as possible to understand how their systems work. Um, it's, it's, it's been quite challenging, but um, because yeah, um, sometimes the priorities uh, of a municipal employee are different to you who wants to get a ball finished and they might want, want to meet part of the municipal financial, uh, some municipal act, but yeah, got to work together to get things completed. And for these deeper holes that we now drilling, um, we are going to have to start shifting to kind of oil and gas drilling technology, which is a bit of a challenge because of the footprint, footprint restrictions we have in these ecologically sensitive areas. Um, but yeah, if we want to drill proper wide diameter holes to depths of over 500 meters, um, we're going to have to start having standards for deeper production borehole drilling, such as casing and grouting, etc. And then finally, um, Going forward um, is the completion of CMRS well fields. So just the drilling and testing of the remaining deep potentially active boreholes. I should say this phase of the CMRS well field, we might expand it in the future. And then continue the regional and well field scale monitoring. So the monitor model manage approach. Um, and this is, yeah, this is important to ensure that there's limited uh, ecological impacts and hydrological impacts. And then looking towards expanding the TMG well field towards Arkenoff, Muberberg, and Tobarscliff. So, like I showed earlier, the T2, T1, and G1 target site areas. And then going forward, I'm talking about the next five to 10 years doing extended TMG exploration in the Frenlandberg, Demersuk, and Full Flow. And then also looking at potential horizontal drilling in the, around the Berg River Dam and, in, and just normal, normal TMG drilling in the South Peninsula um, around Klein Plas. Um, and Lewis Gay Downs. Yeah, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you for letting me talk. Thanks, Dylan. Great stuff. And, and fantastic to see so, um, such rigorous geology and geohydrology being done on these projects. It's really impressive. All right, question time, guys. Dylan, great presentation. I left this project some 17 years ago. And for, for whatever reason, various reasons, uh, this is the first time I've heard a discussion of the project. It was fantastic to see how much great work has been done on this. Uh, so well done to you guys. I've got two, two things. First of all, for the Weberbach geoscientists, a field trip to the Sienbrus area would be really great for two reasons. There's obviously the, the geology as well, but it's also a phenomenal drive to go into the Stienbrus area and then to come out in the Elgin Valley. And th there's a view out over Cool Bay that is, to me, one of the most spectacular views in South Africa. So that could maybe add it to a summertime uh, field visit. To get to more technical stuff, Dylan, uh, what, what I found really lacquer is two concepts which I had proposed many years ago. Uh, the one was 20 to 30% recharge in the TMG and the other one was with cast features in the TMG that's going to really enhance yields uh, deep down. 
those were greeted by huge derision by fellow hydrogeologists around South Africa. I'm so pleased to see that it's now mainstream. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, one of, yeah, you and Chris we know the pioneers of, of this. So yeah, it's, it's been great to finally get it like, off the ground and, and going, yeah. Okay. I would like to support what you've just said, John. And yeah, uh, field trips, everyone's champing at the bits, uh, you know, to get out of out of the offices and out of lockdown. Uh, Dylan, uh, just a, what would be your short answer to like a city official that says to you, as long as there's water in the Stenbras, there will be water in your boreholes? And that they think it's connected. You're, or, you're, you're recirculating the, the Stenbras because there's so many no, right, no, next, we've, right next to them. Yeah, we've already had that question come up. So, so the H1A3 B borehole is actually drilled within a few hundred meters of the upper Stenbras Dam. But we've done um, a whole bunch of isotope, uh, we've done isotope sampling, um, and yeah, it's it's distinct, the groundwater is distinctly different, um, and also the test pumping and where the water strikes are, et cetera, et cetera. There's, it's, it's, so there, there's, there's, there's a whole, whole report on it, yeah, but it's, yeah, at the moment there shows there's no, there's no, you're not, you're essentially not taking from the dam. Like the, the dam itself is is mainly underlain by the Gedo formation shales, which act as a as a barrier to flow. But some part of the dam is underlain by reef flow formation. But then you have, like I explained, you have the Falurin Valley member aquitard between the reef flow and the Skiverberg. So um, and the I production saw, holes, the production that, holes, yeah. uh, the production holes the mainly extract from the Skiverberg. So yeah. Now I just saw that uh, the false bay dikes were displaced along, you know, some of the, and I thought maybe there's connectivity to, you know, to deeper parts. Yeah, but we are, like, we, we do, we do ask, we, we ask to ask to have sampling and, and, and continue oh. chemistry monitoring yeah. to, to check yeah. if there's any. Yeah. I didn't see yeah. it in the presentation, I just thought maybe that data was. Uh, there's another one from me, and I mean, who, who, where's all this monitoring done? I mean, obviously the monitoring is absolutely critical. I mean, is it done by you at Invoto, or is the city involved, or...? or? We, because we're involved in the Wellfield development with Utari, we're not allowed to do the monitoring. So the city, uh, the regional monitoring, we've been doing the, the, the Wellfield monitoring at the moment, uh, because it's just still being set up, obviously. But the, the city requires the monitoring to be done by an independent contractor. So that's where, where I mentioned about Dale um, doing the, the, the monitoring. The GIOS currently have just finished their three-year term doing the, the regional monitoring with the Freshwater Consulting Group. So the city appoints an external independent con contractor to do the monitoring, not the same people that that develop the well field. But we work closely in association with GIOS and the FCC uh, and the city uh, as with the monitoring, but GIOS and FCC do the actual monitoring and the and the data interpretation and stuff, and that all feeds that we all work together. But yeah, they they independent monitoring, they do the independent monitoring. Uh, that's fantastic because you know the Cape Town municipality, like ours, works pretty well compared to most others in the rest of the country. But it's good to hear that it's done yeah. by an independent, you know, private entity. So you have, yeah. and then everything um, to add, which is similar to what's been done in Hermanus. Um, for the past few years is that there is a monitoring committee made up of affected parties. So obviously the city people, ecologists from UCT, uh, Seon, uh, Cape Nature, Sand Parks, uh, DWS, DEDP, National Environmental Affairs. So these monitoring committee meetings are held every six months and the monitoring data is reported on to them. And they actually have the power to, to make decisions. The monitoring committee has the power to make decisions on, on how, if there needs to be any operational changes in the well field. And then that gets taken to DWS to change the conditions in the water use license if required. Obviously, STM Russ, it's just starting up. So it's still a work in progress. But we've had monitoring committee meetings already for that. But Hermanus works like that. So it's been running like that for uh, at least over 10 years now with the monetary committee. So every six months, the data is presented. If things need to change on how the well feels operated, it's, it's made by the monetary committee. And then that gets taken to DWS to, to make any adjustments. It's not just a top-down management approach. It involves specialists and interested affected parties as well. 
Yeah, I think Peter Fenica, do you mind comment? I mean, it also involves citizens of the town, obviously, on that. Yeah, aspect. Peter's Peter's our chairman for the for the minors. Actually, I do have a question to you, Dylan. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Question really relates to, as you said, groundwater is one of a suite of uh, interventions required to meet the future needs of, of Cape Town. I was wondering, the, the constant pumping of the water uh, is what you're doing now, and I can understand that it's for monitoring purposes and all that. But in future, do you envisage that you could, as part of uh, pump in a system context. In other words, there will be times that the system is fairly full or completely full, and that it is then actually not really optimal to pump ground groundwater, being expensive, or the running costs are probably fairly high. But then in drier times, you actually would like to pump more than just the average. You, you actually want to use that storage that the groundwater is there and it's very secure as a source. Yeah. And this is that that will become part of a system system management. Uh, and of course, you'll need more you'll need more production holes. You'll need more equipment for that occasion of, of increasing the the capacity or the the yield actually of production at, the, at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely the well field. And any other future well field, TMG well fields will be will be run conjunctively with surface water. And it'll be brought into the system, the Western Cape water supply system. So obviously if like this year it's rained relatively well, I mean, it's still actually around average, but the dams are filled up at about 98% at the moment. So yeah, in our rainfall years, the well field, yeah, it's, it's not required to be used. It won't be used. Um, it's obviously you don't, you don't want to waste water, so you don't want to pump when you don't have to pump, etc. So I mean, we're still busy developing operational rules and stuff based on how it's, how the water is working now. But it'll more than likely be used in kind of uh, end summer to maybe top. I mean, look, it's not a huge amount of water. It's, it's I mean, it's it's a lot. Of, it's one of the bigger groundwater supply schemes that have been developed at 15 to 20 megaliters per day. But on the scale of water use in the city, it's not it's not a huge amount, but it'll be used to kind of top up the dams or the upper Stiambras Dam uh, in summer if required. And and obviously the well field will be there for drought periods, like you said, going into the future. Um, but yeah, I know it's definitely will be it won't be pumped 24-7 during winter. If it is raining a lot, you, you want the, the especially the, the Nardo aquifer since it's kind of unconfined at parts of surface in that area. You will want it to recover um, during high rainfall periods. So yeah, no, it'll definitely be used in a systems manner uh, with with the surface water storage um, in, in the Western Cape water supply system. I mean, I think it works successfully at Imponis, that approach. I mean, it's used conjunctively with the Boss Dam. So um, at the moment, like the what we haven't pumped the well field too extensively over the last couple of months because of how full the Boss Dam is. But then during the drought period, groundwater was used uh, conjunctively quite well with the Bos Dam to ensure that the dam didn't, the dam levels didn't drop below 60%. That will be the plan going for the, for the city as well. Uh, uh, John Weaver here. Yeah, just to add to that, that the yeah. summer pumping and winter resting is the, uh, is the system that all the, most of the farmers use in the Western Cape with their boreholes. A place like Achterwitzenberg, I've seen that the water levels get dropped about 100 meters, up to 100 meters in summertime. In wintertime, they stop pumping and the water levels recover fully. Uh, so the, you know, the model has already been established. Dylan, I'd like to come back to, to one of the, the questions about the connection to the Stienbrus Dam. Uh, just to explain a little bit further, oxygen isotopes are an extremely useful tool to distinguish between r rainfall recharge uh, where you get a, a high altitude uh, re reach, uh, signature compared to open surface water where you get an evaporative signature. They stand out. It's terribly easy to distinguish between the two. That's obviously it's, uh, it's the best evidence. I mean, the most obvious evidence to show that they're not linked. Yeah. And that's why, that's why Dylan mentioned that you've got what's called cumulative rainfall collectors. You stick up a tube there and you, you collect a sample for the whole year. So you got the average uh, signet, oxygen signature for uh, 
uh, for the recharge zone. Okay. And then just a longer term question is, pre or presumably we were told by our mayor that it's still on the planning board. Um, obviously desalination is still on the planning board in the Cape too, I presume, or Cape Town. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I presented to uh, Eddie last year to, to Whale Coast Conservation. One kind of water resource isn't always, isn't the be all and end all solution. Um, the more you diversify your supply, the more you reduce your risk event drought events so going forward into the future you're going to have to have all four um kind of water resources going so surface water supply groundwater desalination and water use um and i think that's the future for okay not the not the inland cities but definitely for the coastal cities of south africa to use all four resources if, if they have them available like for example um for Hermanus, a water use license for Hermanus only allows from all three well fields to abstract 3.2 million cubic meters per annum. And um, the the license abstraction, the annual license abstraction volume from the Bors Dam is 2.8 million cubic meters per annum. So that's about 6 million cubic meters per annum, which is enough to go, I think, I haven't looked at the, I can't remember the projections offhand, but it's probably enough to last for the next decade or so. But once you start going in the next 30, 40 years um, and, and water use increases and water requirements increase, you're already using your full TMG allocation from the from the well fields of Hermanus and your full divorce dam allocation. So you're going to have to start looking at either water use or desalination or start looking at more regional groundwater schemes. So looking at the TMG outside of the, the greater Hermanus area and going into the Overberg area and developing well fields there. Uh, I, I get really irritated in the paper when like people are like, it has to only be desalination, that's our future. Well, it only has to be this. It's We need a mix of all four kind of water supply options going forward. Um, hi, Dylan. Um, thank you for a great presentation. So I'm also a geologist, but um, professionally I come from a groundwater monitoring sort of small scale, think petrol garage, background from a contaminated uh, land management um, space. So I'm not really well versed in so this sort of the groundwater exploration discipline. I'm curious about the, the construction or the installation of these deep boreholes. Would you guys also have a solid and screened, uh, screen zoned like in a monitoring well? Um, if yes, so how 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 far above the water strike strike would you normally place the the solid casing? Depending on the which aquifer you target, so either the Nodo or the the peninsula. For the Nodo aquifer holes, um, if we drill in through the root flay formation, um, we try screen off the root flay with solid steel casing grouted in, and we 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 kind of target the deeper the or the slightly deeper strikes in the Skiverberg formation. So we usually drill. Uh, into the reflay formation until we pass through the Pillar and Valley member, and then we we screen that off with solid steel casing and grout that in. Um, if the hole isn't collapsing at depth, um, then we usually leave it open so we don't put we don't put PVC in. Um, and the and the the depths are usually deep enough that the pump will be within the solid portion, the solid steel casing. With, um, so we don't need to worry about the pump being damaged if the hole does collapse. Some of the holes we put, some of the, the Nardo holes we've had, we've had to put kind of screen PVC in uh, or down to depth because of collapsing zones. So there the, we screen off the, 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 the fractures themselves. If there's no fractured portion, we usually just have solid casing. For the deeper peninsula holes, we actually, um, we seal off everything above the peninsula formation. We drill into the Pacase formation because there's always a risk you get an artesian strike uh, near the base of the Pacase formation with the peninsula formation. So we drill about 10 meters into the Pacase formation and that range in the Stembrus area that ranged from about between 730 and 790 meters deep. And then we actually install steel casing all the way down to depth, very thick steel casing because of the, the pressures involved. And then grouted that so the, the entire all the upper TMG above the peninsula formation is solidly cased off and grouted because you don't want interaction between the two aquifers um, when you abstract uh, and also because the peninsula formation the peninsula aquifer is artesian in this in this area so those holes be below the 730 to 790 meters steel casing the hole is open 
below that. So there's no there's no PVC in it. Uh, Dylan, just a quick one. Uh, there was a lot of talk at the time that uh, if over extraction occurs in a minus area, it could influence the marine freshwater interface negatively and irreversibly. What has happened to that talk? Has that been put to bed? I say I like, say like intrusion in her minus. We restricted, but oh, the, the 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 Woody license doesn't have a, an abstraction level limit. It has a EC limit of 150 millisiemens per meter, so we can't exceed that. Seawater has a salinity of 5,000 millisiemens per meter, um, and I think John will also be able to talk on that because he did his masters on stress bar, where there's saline intrusion issues, extensive saline intrusion issues there um, from over abstraction. But that case. In that instance, the peninsula formation is, is unconfined and in contact with the ocean. Um, so the, the well field itself abstracts some unconfined peninsula formation in contact with the sea, whereas her minus is a bit different. It's um, like the gateway well field is confined peninsula, and the peninsula is not unlikely that it is uh, unconfined below the sea. Um, so you have the Cedarberg formation and the Hedini formation above it uh, offshore, but still, we still we still do not uh, abstract. So pumped water levels remain above sea level. So um, the current operation rules for gateways, pumped water levels remain above two meters above mean sea level. So we never pull water levels below sea level, and that ensures that there is no risk of saline intrusion into uh, the gateway well field. Thank you. But uh, on that topic, I mean, a lot of, just from some of the monitoring, we've seen a lot of private users in, in Hermanus that have boreholes into the Skiverberg Formation, the Nardo Aquifer, they pump way below sea level. <laughs> and the Nardo Aquifer is in contact with the ocean at Hermanus, so at, with the sea at Hermanus. But I've seen no indication of saline intrusion um, because of that. But that's because usually private users are pumped like, a couple of hours a week, you know. So even though they draw it down, maybe draw water levels maybe 40 meters below sea level, it's not really an issue. And also, you have to take into account the whole um, garbage hose an equation where it's it's a generalized equation. But every meter of fresh water above sea level, you have 40 meters of fresh water below that. Yeah, as long as you don't draw water levels like way way deep during pump, private pumping, which is unlikely because private boreholes are only 100 meters deep or so. You yeah, unlikely will induce saline intrusion. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's all monitored and uh, all the all the boreholes that turn on us are run off yeah, variable speed drives um, to keep the water levels at, when they reach two meters above sea level, they, they stay there. Thanks everyone.